This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This is the King James Code, part two, dealing with the number 10. And if you were to think of something in the Bible that is related to the number 10, the first thing you would say is Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments, right? Well, maybe not the Charlton Heston version, but the Ten Commandments version. And that's really sums up what the meaning of the number 10 is because they are commandments. They are the epitome of the law that God gave to, to Israel, but to mankind in general. I mean, think about it. Everywhere in the world, you don't have to be a Jew to know this. Every place in the world there's some form of the joining together of a man and a woman in an official, sanctioned, ceremonial marriage. The violation of that marriage is commonly called adultery. We know that it's wrong. The law says that it's wrong. In fact, most cultures, most, I say most, Civilizations in the world have some idea that cheating on your spouse is wrong. Even among lost people, most people, when they are having adulterous affairs in their marriage, they cover them up and they don't just announce to their spouse, hey, darling, I'm going out to see my mistress tonight. Can I get you anything from the liquor store? They just don't normally just tell their spouses, although some do. So anyway, the law, God's law, is universal. It is God's way of controlling man. Therefore, it speaks of dominion. Deuteronomy chapter 10 is one of the few places in the Bible where it actually mentions that there are ten commandments. Notice, as we're dealing with the number ten, notice that it's in chapter 10. 10, no, I don't think that's an accident. I don't think it's coincidental. I think it's on purpose. Deuteronomy 10, 4, and he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mountain out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. And what he's speaking about here is Exodus 19. It really is the first place where God speaks to a multitude of people, and they all hear God's voice up on Mount Sinai, and they're going, because ah! it, I mean, it absolutely terrified them. Not the fact that they were hearing some supernatural voice from something up in the clouds up on top of the mountain. It was the fact that they were hearing the terrible voice of God. When I say terrible, I don't mean, oh, it sounded awful. I mean full of terror. So much so that when God finished speaking, the Israelites said, Moses, come here. From now on, if God wants to talk to us, let him tell you what he wants us to know. And then you come tell us. But from, please, from now on, we can't bear that voice again. That's what they did. They instituted the office of a mediator with Moses, Moses being the first mediator of the Old Covenant by way of the Ten Commandments, Christ being the new mediator of a new and better covenant with two commandments. We'll get into that in a little bit. But anyway, I'm establishing this idea of God's spoken authority over mankind. God gave them Ten Commandments, and number 10 represents the number for dominion, Paul says in Romans 7, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And so it would be a shame for me to talk about the law, but not actually read the law, the Ten Commandments. They're found in the, we established this last time, the 70th chapter of the Bible. I'll never forget the first time I, I went. I wonder what's in the 70th chapter of the Bible. And I went, oh. I mean, I got it instantly. The fact that God is speaking his perfect word, that's the number seven, times the number of commandments that there are, times 10, 
70th chapter of the Bible is where God is speaking the Ten Commandments. And I'm just going, that can't be an accident. It just can't be accidental. It has to be on purpose. Whether you believe that man himself, some man somewhere, manipulated the chapter systems or the chaptering system of the Bible to make this part of the Bible, the 70th chapter of the Bible, which that's a stretch. But then to think that God has had his governance and his superintendence over his word from the beginning, that's a little bit easier to believe. Some people don't believe it. Most people don't believe it. But I think it's easy to believe once you realize that these patterns are there, the word order is there, certain chapters appearing in certain places. It just seems like they're in the right place. So let's look at what God said. He said, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. A dear Catholic lady said to me, yeah, I, she cut me off. And I was trying to remind her of the commandments when she goes into her Catholic church. To and she said, I know, our priest said, our priest said that we shouldn't make idols to false gods. I said, man, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And as I was quoting this to this dear Catholic lady, she looked off like she had never heard this before in her life. Part of the reason is because in the official Catholic catechism, they actually list Ten Commandments. But they distinctly and notably omit commandment number two. What they do is they take the 10th commandment and they divide it in half. 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet the night, according to them, the ninth commandment is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house and then the 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and then the rest of it. Really? Somebody have been drinking too much at the Catholic church. So anyway, uh, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The fourth generation, I think, relates to the fourth kingdom. And showing mercy unto thousands. Look at there. Thousands. That number is based upon ten. It's ten times ten times ten, plural. All right? So it shows dominion. Having mercy upon the thousands... Where did I see that here? I lost my place. Of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not, this is number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day you should go to church. No, it doesn't say that, does it? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. He didn't say anything about going to church. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see, and all, them that in, and all that in them is, and the rest of the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is the, now the fifth one's transitional. The first four deal specifically with God. The fifth one transitions from God to earth. God is our Father. Jerusalem above is our mother, but we also have an earthly father and mother. We're to honor both of them. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And then number six, thou shalt not kill. Seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Number ten, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbors. That's the Ten Commandments. They're not suggestions. They are not ten positive ways to influence your family. That's not what they are. They are the commandments of God, and God said don't break them or the death penalty is invoked. We broke them. We deserve death, but God has mercy in store for the thousands that love him and keep his commandments. So anyway, 
That's the reading of the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments, like I said, have dominion over a man, Romans 7, 1, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now, is that just to Jewish men? Because we're going to see later that God actually wrote these commandments in our heart. And I'm going to show you proof of it. There is genetic proof that God wrote his law in our hearts. All right, we'll get to that in a little bit. But let's look at Romans 7 for a little bit and see what God says then about the law. Because the law, the number 10, the commandments, have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And Romans 7 is all about the duality of a born-again believer. He has that inner man in him that serves God and serves God flawlessly. It does not sin. But then there is the outer man. The outer man, while the outer man gets weaker and weaker every day, the inner man is renewed every day. While the outer man despises the commandments, therefore the law has dominion over the outer man, the flesh, and is under the condemnation of the law and the dominion of the law. Therefore, the death sentence applies to my natural body. It's going to die because it disobeyed God. But there is an inner man in me that was put there by the Holy Ghost himself on the day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, and that inner man is renewed every day. So that's what you see in Romans 7. You see that duality of the flesh versus the spirit. But then he uses the analogy of marriage. And I like this, okay? Because there's a, with every doctrine in the Bible, there's a story in the Bible that portrays that doctrine, that, ex, that gives you a picture of what that doctrine looks like. And it's the same in Romans 7. In Romans 7 verse 2 then, oh, by the way, the word, the phrase, the law, has 320 occurrences in the King James Bible. That's a multiple of 10. Ha, I love this. 320 is a multiple of 4. 320 is a multiple of 10. 4 for the Gospels. Uh, 10 for the law having dominion. The phrase, the law. It's found in the King James Bible, a multiple of 10 occurrences, 320 exactly. PureBibleSearch.com, download the software, Linux, Macintosh, or Windows. It'll work. I promise you, you'll love it. Now to verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if... While her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that which should bring forth fruit unto God. Now think of that last statement in the context of the parable of the seed and the sower. The parable of the seed and the sower, there's four types. The seed goes on to way, uh, wayside and Satan cometh to devour the, the seed up and that person, that wayside person is not saved. The second group, stony ground, it falls on stony ground. They receive the word but they do not endure because of tribulation or because of persecution or they get offended at the word of God. And they say, well, I don't believe that part of the Bible and they bear no fruit. The third group, because of the multitude of sins and lust and worldliness that is in their life, those things choke the word of God out and they bear no fruit. And we know that not bearing fruit equals you're cut down and cast into the fire. We know that from Scripture. The fourth group is the good ground, that rich soil with all that corruption. You know, a compost pile, right? You have a compost pile for your garden. 
you throw in all your fish guts, you throw in everything left over from supper, you throw in grass clippings, leaf clippings, everything that's rotten goes into your compost and that makes good ground. It's all of the dead sins falling off of our life and the corruption of our life that makes the good ground for the seed of the Word of God to grow in. Amen? The worst sinners in the world find the best grace in, in the universe. Amen? But anyway, back to this. He uses the illustration of a woman. Now, I see it clearly in the Bible, and I've taught this many times. The soul of every human being in the world is regarded as a female. David said in the Psalms, my soul maketh her boast in the Lord, her. And there's other places, won't get into that. But think about your soul then, bound by your flesh body. That's the husband. And the law hath dominion over that man. So then, while she is married to the flesh, she cannot be joined with another husband who is Jesus Christ. So what has to happen? That man has to die, so now that soul is free to be joined to this other man. And that other man, have, and he says it plainly, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I love that. It's all about bearing. The last King James Code we did was on, well, it wasn't the last one, uh, but we did it on, we did one previously on the number nine, and in the ninth book of the New Testament, which is Galatians, you have, guess what? The nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temp meek, meekness, temperance. Against, there, against such there is no law. Okay? So anyway, now we look at the story. Now, I've taught this several times, so you may have heard this, but let's put it in the context of the meaning of this number 10. We have the story, 1 Samuel 25, of a woman by the name of Abigail. And Abigail is already married. She's married to a man by the name of Nabal, and Nabal is an idiot. He's a fool. He's a mean hateful, vengeful, bossy, drunk, old man. And that's who our soul is married to, right? And David comes along, and David is the king. He represents Christ, and David sends word to Nabal saying, Hey, I've been fighting battles for you. I've protected you. I've protected your land. We're moving through. Will you help feed my soldiers? I got 400 of them, and I know you've got plenty of land, plenty of food. Will you help feed us, water our horses, and then we'll move on? And Nabal sends word back saying, Who's David? I don't care nothing about no David. I don't care nothing about no thing that you say you've done. That's our flesh. Our flesh fought our soul wanting to start going to church. Amen? Our flesh, our wicked Nabal flesh, despised the religion of Jesus Christ. Poor Abigail. So when David finds out that Nabal hates David, and Nabal said all these things, David pulled his sword out, told his soldiers, you guys come with me. We're gonna, there's going to be a killing today. Any, there isn't going to be a man left standing over there. David would have went and slaughtered that whole house, probably including Abigail. When Abigail found out, she loaded up her camels and her donkeys and everything with food and wine and snuck over to David, bowed before him, and prayed to him. She gave her petition to David. She said, David, please forgive us. Forgive my husband of his sins. Forgive him for what he said and what he did. And my Lord, she called David Lord. Whosoever should call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But anyway, she said, my Lord, if you'll just spare us. I mean, here, here, I brought plenty of wine, plenty of food for your soldiers. Please don't kill us. David put his sword back in his sheath and he said, you know what? He said, uh, you're a good woman. 
He said, I was going to go and make a huge mistake and it was going to reproach me the rest of my life. And David is the Lord Jesus Christ who hearkens to the prayers of the soul of any person who wants to come to Jesus humbly and beg his forgiveness. David heard her prayer, put his sword back in his sheath, and he said, go in peace. I love this. Now, we're going to pick up the story, 1 Samuel 25, verse 36. Nabal had a big, Abigail goes back. Nabal's having a big party and he's drunk. So she's not going to tell him what she did then. Next morning he's going to wake up. Then she's going to lay it on him. Remember, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. So that the woman married to that man, she can't go and be with another man while this man liveth. If she does, she's an adulterer. So then, and I was going to say something and I will. All of these churches that keep talking to their people about being intimate with Jesus. You need to be intimate with Jesus. You need to have this intimate relationship with Jesus. You, can you kind of see where I'm going with this? What I'm thinking here? It's almost like they're telling these church people to commit adultery because their flesh is still alive. They shouldn't be out flirting with other men. And that's not what Abigail did. Abigail was simply asking for grace and mercy and salvation, deliverance. That's what she was asking for. She wasn't flirting. She didn't show David her tattoos. Okay? She didn't send selfies of her duck face to David. Okay? Watch this stuff going on. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. So anyway, the soul cannot be married, cannot be joined with Christ because her husband is still alive. But the moment he dies, she's now free to marry another to bring forth fruit. Mm. So let's pick it up, verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him. Ho, 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 ho. For he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. And look at here, he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. Do you see that? Isn't that neat? The Bible, just, the Bible just drew a picture of exactly what Paul said in Romans 7. Nabal is your flesh. Ab Abigail tells Nabal, hey, I met a guy. His name is Jesus. Okay? And he saved me. And when Nabal heard this, his heart died, turned to stuff. The Ten Commandments were written in what? Stone. His heart turned to stone ten days. That's God's way of telling you that Abigail is under the dominion of Nabal, her husband. Even if he's a bad guy, she's under his authority until he dies. But once he dies, she's now free to be married to another. So what do you think happened? If you've never heard this story before, what do you think happened? She did. Verse 40, When the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her, and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. I used this illustration when I was talking about how the number five was related to the rapture. Because when we're translated, we, that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. We get to join with Jesus because our old man's dead. Our old Nabal his heart turned to stone and he died. Now the law doesn't have dominion over Abigail, over our soul anymore. Now we're free to marry another. And she took her five, to, and the rapture is associated with the number five. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then 
We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I hope you're comforted today. Now back to Romans 7, because there's more here that speaks of the number 10, the law and its dominion and what it does. Romans 7, 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. And of course, the phrase, the commandment, with an asterisk, meaning the commandment or the commandments, is found exactly 30 times in the New Testament, which is 3 times 10. It's dominion, people, it's, and it's King James, it's perfect. But anyway, notice that the commandment deceived him, and by that deception, slew him. There is another story about that doctrine. And it takes us back to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. In Numbers 13, Moses sent out one man from every tribe of Israel. That would be 12. And he sent them out for 40 days. 40 days. That's four times 10. Sent them out for 40 days into Canaan land to spy out the land. And when they came back, if you remember, some of them said, we can't go in that land. We can't go. The walls are too high. The buildings are too big. The giant, every one of those people there are giants. We saw the sons of Anak there. We can't go in. But then we have another group of those spies that said, oh, yes, we can. God said that he would give us that land. God said that those people would be breakfast bars for us. We would just consume them or God would make them pass away. And as soon as they saw us, they would die of fright. Whatever it was, God said that he would take us and give us victory and give us that land. Now, here's how it's divided up. Because we know that it was Joshua and Caleb. Numbers 14 says that they had another spirit in them which is why they, and it was a spirit of belief. They just believed what God said. So that leaves us with 10. 10 spies deceived the people of Israel by telling them, we can't go in. And because of that deception, everybody of the people of Israel that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. Notice the Old Testament is the Ten Commandments. The New Testament is the Two Commandments. What do I mean by that? In the Old Testament, we have the Ten Commandments. We just read those. The New Testament, there are only two commandments. You know what they are? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to see another illustration of those two commandments in picture form in your Bible. But think of it like this. The ten, referencing the law, the law, the Ten Commandments, will tell you you can't go to heaven. Why? Because like Paul said, even though the law was ordained to life, I found it to be of death. Because I broke the law, therefore I'm under the condemnation of the law, therefore I have to die. The law deceived me, and by that deception, it slew me. So look in verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. That is the opposite of the report mentioned in Isaiah 53, where it talks about the things that happened to Christ on the cross, who hath believed our report. The good report is the gospel. The evil report is the law, the ten spies saying you can't go. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now look in Numbers chapter 14, verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. And there you see it. The ten spies, the law, say that they cannot go into the promised land. The two spies, which are the new covenant, says, oh yes, we can. Do you understand that? The old, if you're going to follow the Old Testament to our Hebrew roots friends, our sacred name friends, our Seventh-day Adventists, if you're going to say that you have to keep Torah in order to attain eternal life, then you're required then to keep all of the law, not just the parts that you pick and choose, but you have to keep every single law that God said. And you can't do it. It's not possible to do it. There was only one that did, and he was Jesus Christ, and you're not him and never will be. And so the law, if you're just going to go by the law and remember when you got saved, when you got saved, you were confronted with your transgressions breaking God's law, God's dominion over you. You rebelled against it and you were confronted with that and you were in great fear that you were going to go to hell. You were not going to go to heaven. You were not going to inherit the promised land. That's what the law was for. The law was to make you guilty before God. That Christ came, fulfilled the law, didn't break the Ten Commandments, and He gave us two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your might, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is part of the new covenant, and the new covenant is of faith, not of works. See, if it's of works, if I told you that from now on, you could never blink your eyes. And if, you, and if you did that, if you refrained from blinking your eyes, and some of you are blinking like 20, 30 times already because I said that. But if you refrain from blinking your eyes for the rest of your life, then God will give you heaven. But if you blink, oh, I just did it. If you blink your eyes one time, you're not going. And that puts people in constant fear then that they're always going to be afraid. What if I make a mistake and blink my eyes? You can't help it. You're, go you're going to blink your eyes and you are going to do things that are wrong. You're going to break God's law. So which one will tell you you could go to the promised land? The ten spies, the law, or the two spies with a different spirit? They're the ones that are telling you, you can go in. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. I love this. Now, here is the New Testament law. Remember, here's what Jesus said. He said, as I have kept my father's commandments, so you keep my commandments. You see, Jesus kept the commandments of God his father, the Ten Commandments. He kept them flawlessly. He did not break any of them. But then he gives us, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Instead of Ten Commandments, I'm going to give you two, and they're real easy. I love the Lord your God. I love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? So, and let's read a particular place where he said that, because there's a story that illustrates it, and it's going to show you the law in type, typology. Okay? Matthew 22, 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul 
and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then notice verse 40, which is four times ten. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to fulfill all the law? All of the law, and I mentioned this earlier, when we were reading the Ten Commandments, you could clearly see that five of them were specifically targeted toward God. Loving the Lord your God. You love the Lord your God, you won't make images, you won't take His name in vain, you'll remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? And you'll honor your Father, which is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's honoring your Father. Then the other commandments, the number five is transitional. It transitions us from, you know, directed toward God to directed toward people of this earth, including our earthly father and mother. Even if they're lost, even if they're lost, you still honor them. If your father and mother is a Roman Catholic and you don't, you're not Roman Catholic and you're opposed to the Roman Catholic Church and you don't want to partake mass, they die and and I've had somebody ask me this question, should I go to the funeral? Yeah. Honor thy father. Now, don't take the mass, you don't have to. But go to the funeral and honor your father and honor your mother. Okay? That's a good thing to do. God doesn't have a problem with you doing that. Even if they're lost, God doesn't have a problem with that. But anyway, then the other commandments are directed toward man. Thou shalt not kill man. Thou shalt not commit adultery with, you know, other people's wives and so on. Thou shalt not steal from man. Thou shalt not bear false witness against man. Thou shalt not covet what your neighbor has. Don't be lusting after his wife or his daughter, his son, or anything that he has. Don't be lusting after them, right? So those five toward God, five toward man, all right? And he said, on these two, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. On these two hang all the law and prophets. There's a story in the Bible of this. How many fingers am I holding up? Ten. So my hands are going to represent the law. And remember, on these two hang all the law and prophets. Before I get there, I'm going to show you how God, and I like this. I like these, these typological illustrations. On my right hand is my New Testament. And us Gentiles, we all read from left and we read toward the right, in the direction of the right. The New Testament is on the right. God's right hand. Where is Jesus at? He's not at God's left hand. God's, that's weakness. He's on the strength of God's right hand. The book is in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals, right? So the right hand is the hand of strength. The left hand is the hand of weakness. The law is here. Okay? Satan's over here on the left hand. Um, and I don't know what verse that is, so don't quit. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But anyway, it's a good illustration. But anyway, the law is weak. Left hand. Hebrew is written toward the left. Weak. Weakness, right? Here's what Romans 8 says. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So now remember this, that the law is weak because it's weak through the flesh. Now, let me illustrate it like this. You may have a lot of resolve in you. Let's say you just had a little revival. And I mean, you're on fire for God. And the devil, I mean, it seems like he can't touch you. In reality, he can't. Because, I mean, you are busting out for Jesus Christ. How long does that last? Not very long. And you say to yourself, wow, I finally got here. Man, the way I feel now, I'll never sin again the rest of my life. Day two. 
Day three. Day four. Day five. Day six. And you're getting weaker and weaker every day. And the tempter, the temptations are stronger and stronger every day. And you give in. The flesh truly is weak. The spirit is willing. But it's the flesh that's weak. Now there's a story about this. Okay? You're going to love it. Exodus 17. Amalek. Amalek. The name Amalek has Malak in it, which is like a Hebrew word related to like a, a king or a principality or a, like an evil ruler, like Moloch. Okay? So Amalek represents, let's say it represents principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, high places. It's what we're wrestling against. And Amalek is fighting against Israel. And this is the story where Moses did this and Israel prevailed. And when he did this, Amalek prevailed. Remember that story? Let's go read it. And remember, the law is weak, and on these two hang all the law. Okay? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel. This is Exodus 17, 8, in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let it down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now look at verse 12. But Moses' hands, plural, ten fingers, were heavy. Stop right here. Do this. Now, pause the video and then see how long you can hold your hand. Just with nothing in them. Moses was holding a rod. But with nothing in them, how long can you hold your hands up? Not very long. Moses' hands were heavy. The law is a burden. See my ten fingers? The law is a burden that we can't manage. We can't hold it up. We can do it for a while. But then they're going to fall. Right? And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on it. Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. You see it? Aaron and Hur are the two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and prophets. And as long as Aaron and Hur held up Moses' hands, Israel beat the daylights out of Amalek and won the victory. And you do too. Because Christ's strength upholds all the law and prophets. He fulfilled all the law for us so that if we are in Christ, we receive what He receives. Isn't that beautiful? On these two hang all the law, right here, and prophets. Aaron and Hur holding up the hands of Moses, the ten, so that the battle can be won. So I love the King James Bible. And I love knowing the numbers. And even though it never says, he held up the ten fingers of his hands. He says his hands, and I, you know there's ten fingers on them. And that represents the law hanging and prevailing. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we know that when Christ was born, He was born of a woman, and He was made 
under the law. He fulfilled the law. He was made under the law. He was the law. He was keeping the law. But the Bible says he also took the ordinances that were, this is Colossians, he took the ordinances that were against us, the Ten Commandments, what did they pierce? They pierced my hands and feet. Ten fingers, ten toes. He took the ordinances that were against us, nailing them to his cross. I, lo I love this. Amen. Now take a look at this, because I told you that every civilization in the world knows that if a man's married and he runs out on his wife and he's committing adultery with another woman, that's wrong. Every civilization in the world, every country in the world, if a man owns a piece of property, like a bowl or a wallet with $100 in it, and somebody else picks that up and puts it in their pocket and walks off with it and never gives it back, every civilization in the world says, that's wrong. Now, how is it that stealing, lying, committing adultery, coveting, murdering. How is it that man knows that all these things, man's born knowing that all these things are wrong? The Bible says in Romans 2 verses 14 and 15, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The Bible says that the law is written even in the Gentiles' hearts. Now notice I have a picture of DNA up here. Let me show you this. DNA is a crystal. It literally is a stone. And in one helical turn of that DNA crystal, there are exactly 10 base pairs. Now these base pair combinations are what makes the word. And let me illustrate it like this. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, and what binds them together, just like the two rungs of DNA, are the four Gospels. The four Gospels are where Jesus the Word is. In the beginning, this, I'm in John, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So you have the two rungs of DNA, one Old, one New Testament. They're joined together by the four base pairs and it's the base pairings, the combination of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine together in different combinations. That's what makes the letters that makes the word of DNA, just like the word shows up in the four Gospels of the Bible. Well, DNA has a, has a turn. It has a twist to it, that Fibonacci ratio, right? Remember that? And in that turn, from one place in the turn to its next place is 10 base pairs together. That's God's way of signifying to mankind that he, in fact, did write the law in the hearts of mankind. Since we're dealing with the law, and, we're dealing, and we noted that in Genesis 10, the very first king shows up. The very first use of the word kingdom shows up. In fact, it's in Genesis 10, verse 10. It's the very first time the word kingdom shows up in the Bible. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. We also noted that the 70th chapter of the Bible is where the Ten Commandments, that's God having dominion over man, that's ten times seven. So we have the Ten Commandments bringing about the kingdom of Almighty God. And in John chapter 3, there was a man by the name of Nicodemus. He wanted to know how he could get to heaven. And how did, what did Jesus say to him? John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the phrase kingdom of God is found 69 times in the King James Bible. But the phrase kingdom of God, apostrophe S, 
is mentioned one time, so it's like the kingdom of God's something another, which gives you a total of 70 times. Remember the Ten Commandments are in the 70th chapter of the Bible. Now, John 3 is the 1,000th chapter of the Bible, which is 10 times 10 times 10. John 3 is the chapter that tells you how to get into the kingdom of God, which is going to last for 1,000 years, which is 10 times 10 times 10. And that's in the 1,000th chapter of the Bible. And it's the Ten Commandments in the 70th chapter of the Bible that establish the kingdom of God, which is mentioned 70 times in the King James Bible. And oh, by the way, the phrase, the kingdom, just in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is mentioned exactly 100 times, which is 10 times 10. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? And all I did was, I had this idea that certain words and phrases being associated with certain ideas like the law and dominion and kings and kingdoms and so on, I just looked them up in the King James Bible. There they are. 1,000th chapter of the Bible telling you how to get into the kingdom of God. The phrase kingdom of God mentioned 70 times. 70th chapter of the Bible, the Ten Commandments. 10 times 7. Okay? Uh, the tabernacle, the typology of the wilderness tabernacle. The tabernacle was, if you remember, you have the curtain, you have the courtyard, you have the, um, the altar, then you have the sanctuary, table of showbread, and the candlestick. And then the Ark of the Covenant, which was the mercy seat of God. That's literally where God sat. The Ark of the Covenant that Moses made was a picture of the literal throne that God sits on in heaven. Okay, His mercy seat in heaven. So wherever the Ark of the Covenant was and wherever God's throne was, that showed that God had dominion over his people. So in the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, the sanctuary was made of 10 curtains. The boards that made up, remember there's like 46 boards, 20 down the north side, 20 down the south side, and six across the west side. But then those boards themselves are 10 cubits high, making the, the tabernacle sanctuary made of 10 curtains being 10 cubits high. Then we look at the outer wall of the sanctuary. It was to be exactly 100 cubits. That's 10 times 10. The west and east facing walls, the curtain walls, had to have 10 pillars each in them. And then, of course, in the most holy place, where the thr inside the throne of God, were the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. That shows God's dominion. Now, I can't verify this with Scripture. Jewish Encyclopedia, Unger's Bible Dictionary, other sources that I read, and I'm not sure where they get the information from, says that the most holy place itself was, we know it was 10 cubits high. Some of the early authorities say that it was 10 cubits wide from south to north and that it was 10 cubits long from east to west, making it 10 times 10 times 10. That would be a thousand cubic cubits. If it's true, that would be cool. I couldn't verify it with scripture, so I can't say 100% that it's true. But concerning the tabernacle itself with the 10 curtains and it being 10 cubits high and there being it being 100 cubits long, 10 times 10, and 10 pillars across the front. You have all these tens in the sanctuary where the throne of God is, where the 10 commandments are. Isaiah 16:5 says, "And in mercy shall the throne be established." And he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. 
And then that catapults us to Revelation 20, verse 4, where John said, I saw thrones, plural, and they sat upon them, meaning those that I think return with Jesus and white horses, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's 10 times 10 times 10. And by the way, the exact phrase, thousand years, is mentioned exactly 10 times in the King James Bible. Hmm. It just gets better and better and better. I'll, let me show you another one. Revelation 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of Kings. Notice, Lord of Lords is capitalized. King of Kings is capitalized, meaning that he's king even over of Elvis. I'm the king. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The, the word king with a capital K. Stop right here. Did you know that you could do that with the Pure Bible Search software? Type in capital K, I-N-G, and then hit the little box that says case sensitive. So instead of just looking for a generic word, king, it'll look for all the occurrences of the word king with the capital K. Seventy times exactly. Not 69, not 71. Seventy times exactly in the King James Bible. Zechariah 14, 16, and it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, there it is with a capital K, 70 times, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is also mentioned exactly 10 times in the King James Bible. So look at this. I'm, I'm breaking this down here for you. The Ten Commandments are in the 70th chapter. The phrase kingdom of God is 70 times in the Bible. The phrase king with a capital K, 70 times exactly. I think God's word is numerically perfect. Meaning that I think God's word is perfect. I think every word of God is in here by the choice of God by the inspiration of God, by the preservation of God, by the translation, interpretation of God. And I would not dare take one word out or put one new word in. I wouldn't think of it. So what if I wanted to add an extra king with a capital K? Well, that messes up the order 